So uh, before I begin, I do want to say that, you know, I'm taking working remotely very literally today. I'm, I'm broadcasting from my, my car. Uh, when I agreed to do this, um, the, the, the team that I helped coach, the People's Academy Wolves Nordic Ski Team, their state meet was going to be two weeks before this date, but things happened, so we're compromising, and I'm in the parking lot. The girls just competed, and it was a great day, so thank you for accommodating me. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the title of my talk is What Lies Beneath Compartmentalization, Non-Conductive Wood, and Impacts on Sugar Maple, Sap Flow, and Sustainability. It's really timely because sap is definitely flowing today. And we're going to talk about how just the basic physiology of trees impacts this, this very applied and practical um, discipline that is so quintessential for Vermont. So I do want to give a little overview. Uh, people come from Maple, come to Maple from different levels of knowledge. So I just want to give you a couple of quick important things to remember. Sugar makers have to drill new tap holes each season. And this is, uh, will be abundantly clear once we get into this talk. Um, the reason for that is because trees respond to that wound by producing an area of non-conductive wood. So that xylem tissue that's below the bark, which during the growing season normally conducts water, uh, is the same tissue that we're cutting into to harvest sap during the spring. And it is a wound, it's a small wound relative to the tree, but it is a wound and the tree responds to that wound by a, um, a very well adapted process of, of wound healing and compartmentalization. Practically speaking, there aren't a whole lot of clues for the sugar maker as far as where the old tap holes are. Um, occasionally you'll see this next slide, you'll see a little bit of a deformation on the bark. You can see maybe that there was a, uh, an old tap hole there. It, it can be tricky, especially if there's snow on the trees. So it becomes a real issue in terms of knowing where that area of non-conductive wood is. Luckily for the trees uh, perspective, it adds new conductive wood every year in the form of an annual growth ring. So the tree is making up for this injury each year. Like I said, trees are highly compartmentalized plants and they have a very robust uh, wound response system. Alex Shigo formalized this process in the CODIT model um, and it has continued to endure and people continue to use that as the standard for wound response in trees. So the wound response system is, is uh, anatomical and physiological in that the, 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 the makeup, the, the anatomy of that tissue will prevent a systemic infection as well as an active process that the tree devotes energy into um, uh, walling off this tissue and preventing real systemic infection and in the worst case, mortality. Not all trees are good compartmentalizers. Sugar maple happens to be excellent at, at this process. So looking really microscopically, this is a cross section of a small piece of sugar maple wood. And you'll see these, what appear to be white circles. Those are actually the large vessel elements that conduct water during the growing season. And they actually have the same conduct, uh, conducting pipes that that the sap flows through during the spring sap flow period. The material around those large vessels, those relatively large vessels, are the fibers. That's what gives trees its strength and they do not conduct water. So we're cutting into those larger vessels to harvest the sap during the growing season. The last really important thing to look at is the uh, large dark lines that are oriented vertically in this picture. Those are actually the ray cells, and that's the storage uh, cell for the tree. That's where the starch is stored and then converted to sugar uh, as the tree needs it. The CODIT model looks at these various anatomical features and um, physiological responses to wounding in terms of walls. So uh, Shago looked at it in terms of walls, and not all walls have the same strength. Shago oriented this wall uh, uh, concept in by numbering them. So wall one is the weakest wall, wall four is the strongest wall. So wall one, it, it forms here and it forms in the, um, in the vestal elements in terms of a gummy plug material or um, some other plugging that prevents water from movement. As you can see, these are very large cells and so it's hard to shut that system down, those large vessel elements. It's been described as being similar to shutting the doors on a 
on a submarine. Um, it does work, but if you're trying to do it when the submarine is diving, it makes it harder because there's so much water uh, uh, pressure there. So wall one forms there. And I should say that these cells are oriented um, vertically, uh, roughly. There's many, many connections in between these vessel elements, but the general orientation is vertical. Wall two is formed by uh, what's called the late wood, the thicker walled later season cells that are laid down later in the growing season. And here you can see I've highlighted those. Between those clusters of red dots would be one growing season. And so the tree is a little bit better at walling off that tissue uh, in, in that wall too. And consequently, the, the staining and the, the, the uh, potential for decay is less in terms of wall one compared to wall, uh, wall two compared to wall one. We're going to change views now to look at wall three. And this is a, zoomed out a little bit. You may or may not uh, be able to identify this picture as an old tap hole. Um, that has been cut right through the center of the, the tap hole. But wall three forms utilizing the uh, ray cells. So they essentially hem in the infection from side to side compared to where the, the tap hole is. Um, this has to do with anatomical features and physiological effects of how the tree responds to that wound. There's a um, chemical properties that are, that are generated uh, actively uh, to produce um, a better barrier than wall one or wall two. So you can see the old drill bit went in, the tree has grown for a few years since that tap hole was made. And the staining, the tree's response to that wound is a column of this non-conductive wood. It extends only a little bit um, side to side compared to the relatively large stain in the vertical direction. The last wall, wall four, is actually the, the boundary between the current year growth when that injury took place, and then all wood that is laid down after that point. So you can see wall four is right there. That's the moment right there is when the injury took place and the wood beyond that was not stained because that barrier between wall, um, wall four is a very, very effective barrier. While we're looking at this picture, I do wanna point out one quick thing. Those tap holes that are made every year by sugar makers don't fill in. In this case, a little bit of callus tissue did kind of produce this inclusion inside the, the void of the tap hole, but the tree never fills in that, that hole. And actually, believe it or not, you can see there's a little bit of bark that was formed on the inside of that tap hole. So functionally speaking, inside that tap hole, it's now buried within four or five years worth of growth from the tree's perspective is the outside of the tree. So it's a little bit kind of a fun thing to think about. So these areas of non-conductive wood, they persist over time. So the, the, the tree does not uh, magically um, remove that stained column. It just covers it over with new growth. And so as you can see in this picture, if there was no bark on the tree, it would be very obvious to, to um, to avoid those areas of non-conductive wood. Luckily for the tree's um, uh, sake, there is this protective barrier of wood, and so it becomes a much harder job to identify where those staining columns are. The other uh, th uh, issue that comes out is a lot of times sugar makers are uh, instructed to set a certain pattern, like up a certain number of inches and over a certain number of inches in order to avoid tap holes, old tap holes. The, the problem with that pattern is that it assumes consistent stain volume and that that stain is oriented in the same direction, always vertically. These look fairly vertical, but it's not always the case. Here's a quick picture from my predecessor, Tim Wilmot, who tapped a tree, had the tree initiate that wound response system, and then cut that fresh column of stem and pressurized it enough with dye. You can see that the dye did not go in that area of, of discolored wood, plus a little bit around the edge. So that's a good example of how non-conductive that tissue becomes when the tree responds to the wound. So like I said, the staining columns are not all the same size. Uh, Abby Vandenberg has some unpublished unpub data that shows the variability can be quite high, anywhere from 20 to 200 times the size of the tap hole. And the other issue that we'll get to is like I said before, that staining, even though 
And all the illustrations I've given you so far have shown them to be roughly vertical. They're not always vertical. And uh, I do want to point out that these illustrations came from a project, a really nice collaborative project with the Proctor Maple Research Center, UVM Extension, and the Across the Fence team, um, trying to really distill down some of these concepts and um, root them in modern science and research and make them available for producing. And they're responding for sure. We've had very good uptake. Um, this series is viewed has been viewed 20,000 times so far on YouTube. So we're, we're feeling good about, about uh, the outreach on that. When we ask sugar makers, how often do you hit brown wood? Um, it, we get a variety of answers. This is a, uh, some data that we received. Mark Cannell and I did a, a, a producer survey as part of a grant. And we found that almost half um, suggest that they see it maybe one to 4% of the time and um, you can see some actually have quite a bit more um, and then some say never and this is a tricky one as I'll, I'll, I'll show in a second here. The key question is though just because you hit stained wood what's the impact on sap yield? Um, most sugar makers intuitively understand that if you hit non-conductive wood you're going to get less sap and if you were using buckets you'd have a very good <laughs> sense of, of how little you get. The issue with the tubing system is it's all, all that sap is commingled. And so you aren't able to see individual tree variation. There's a lot of good things about tubing systems, reduced labor, um, increased ability to tap areas that weren't previously accessible. Um, this is not one of the benefits of tubing system, understanding how each tree is, is, is producing sap. So the, the question remains. And so I did this little study to try to answer that question. So this, uh, this small study looked at uh, 20 trees with a history of tapping. So they've been previously tapped. I uh, used a series of gravity tubing lines that are able to generate pretty good vacuum, a single tree per line and a single tap per tree. Those 20 trees are divided up into two groups. 10 uh, were tapped directly above the previously year's tap pole and 10 were tapped into clean wood. Now, it's not best practices to tap directly above an old tap hole for all the reasons I've mentioned, but this is the point of this project. How, what is the impact? Actually putting some numbers to it. And I put that asterisk there because three out of the 10 trees that I tapped just an inch above an old tap hole failed to hit stained wood at all. And this is one of those great scientific sort of moments when you expected to get non-conductive wood all 10 times, but three out of those 10 times, I didn't. And what it likely is attributed to is the grain of the wood being something less than perfectly straight. Any of the woodworkers out there understand that this does happen from time to time. And even just one inch above an old tap pole, I didn't hit any stained wood. So that's pretty interesting. So each of those trees were measured for total sap production on two different years, 2018 and 19. And I also collected the wood chips um, from each of those 20 trees. This is what the setup looked like with individual chambers and sap lines. And if you were there when I was doing the tapping, you'd see a pretty rinky-dink uh, plastic bin tied around my waist uh, as I was tapping these trees, collecting all these chips. Um, not always pretty, but it, it was effective at capturing every single chip that came out of the, each tap hole. Here's just an example of how different um, those chips would look if you tapped into stained wood. So very different. So I brought those chips in, I sorted them, um, separated them based on if they were presumably conductive or not conductive, and then uh, sorted them. And here's an illustration of one that was all clean wood. And then here's one where it's a mixture of non-conductive uh, non wood, conductive wood, and bark. You can see quite a bit of non-conductive wood just from one tap pole and that there was a little bit of conductive wood. Presumably that came from the growth that had happened since that original tap hole. Um, so this tree would have had some conductive wood available to that spout. So we look at the, the actual amounts of sap you produce. It's um, pretty dramatic. So again, these are individual trees, season long sap production for two different years. Um, either completely conductive tissue or a mixture of conductive and non-conductive tissue. 
The first year I found that on average, there was 75% less, less sap coming out of the, the trees that had hit staining wood. <clears throat> and that's an amazing amount uh, of reduction that you wouldn't even really know from the outside because like I said, the tubing systems are sealed. You can't see individual tree production. Just that loss would be spread out across the entire sugar bush. There was some variability for sure that I'll get into in a second. But the second year was similar. It was a 70% reduction. So clearly significant impact when you hit stained wood. Now, the beauty of collecting all the chips and measuring their, their mass is that you're able to look at, was there any difference in how much stained wood were in each of these uh, stained uh, tap holes? And when you look at that um, based on a percent, you see the following. So here are two years worth of data, 2018 and 19. And the relationship is very strong. The, the more non-conductive wood, the more staining you intercept, the less syrup, and I turn it, put it in terms of syrup production, the less you produce. If you hit just a little, the impact won't be so great. If you hit a lot, the impact will be, will be uh, quite large. Now remember, this is before anything else happens. It's before the squirrel gets to that drop line and nibbles on it. It's before something goes wrong with the vacuum pump or the people doing the tapping forgot to run a few of the, the tap holes. So this is right off the top and sugaring is a lot of work and there's a lot of effort involved and it's too much work to, uh, to leave some of that sap uh, on the table as it were by uh, intercepting um, this stained column. So the outputs from this uh, include, like I said, the, the videos that we had um, some terrific help from, um, from Keith Silva and the Across the Fence team we also did presentations for sugar maker groups and Tim and Abby have also put out some, um, some more information on some um, resources to sugar maker communities. And we've all been able to share this information as people learn more and more about it. So it's been um, excellent getting this word out. I think a lot of people intuitively thought that there was a reduction, but they didn't know the magnitude of it. So that's, that's really helpful. The next steps are really sort of formalizing this in terms of recommendations and not just recommendations for tapping, but also recommendations for fostering um, good forest management. Because remember, it's the annual growth that puts on more conductive wood. And if we want these trees to be tapped sustainably, we want to maximize the amount of conductive wood that's put on every year. And that's done by good careful management, not doing a lot of thinning all at once, um, but, uh, but careful management. And so we're working towards that. Another is just continuing to spread the word, letting people understand that there is a significant loss that is potential um, and to take time. A lot of times in tapping, it's a go, go, go. People really want to um, go as fast as they can, but sometimes it's not the best, the best thing. Sometimes you need to slow down, take a little bit of each uh, time at each tap hole and make sure you're getting into, into good wood. This picture on the right, um, I just shared because, you know, a, a roadside bucket tree is kind of quintessential. You see that imagery a lot in, in maple, but if you look a little bit closer, you'll see there's actually 10 or 11 tap holes all in that one little area. And although it's iconic, that image of, of, a, of a roadside tree with a bucket on it, it's probably not the most sustainable practice. Um, and so hopefully we'll continue to get people's awareness and, and understand the relationships be between you know, careful tapping, non-conductive wood accumulation and, and sap harvesting. So there was a lot in there, tree anatomy, sugaring, lots of, uh, things to talk about, but I really appreciate the opportunity to share this information. And I think we're going to do questions at the end, Chris, or are we going to do them right now? We're going to hold questions to the end. You already have two in the Q&A box, um, and we'll let you get a little head start on answers while Mark Canella uh, swaps in. 